Well, good morning and welcome to Sunnyside, where we are people following Jesus. To those not yet, hey, my name is Sean. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we've been in a series entitled Drift Happens. And specifically, what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get really practical. And we're talking about what happens in our life when we happen to drift away from the plans and intention of God. Now, the, the key verse that we've been using throughout the series is found in Hebrews chapter 2. And it says this, it says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Now this morning, I want to start off by just asking a simple question. Uh, how many of you would say you have been told to pay attention in your life? <laughs> listen, everybody's hands, listen, there's no lying in the house of the Lord. Everyone's hands should be up in this place. Because see, I remember, I remember being a teenager once and being told maybe once, twice, maybe 50,000 times, Sean, would you just pay attention? Parents, now you all know what I'm talking about. Because when your kids are running around crazy, right? And you're looking at them and, and you're just like, guys, would you just pay attention to me? Come on, what are you doing? Listen. Look, listen, in, in life, if, if we don't pay attention, we can end up in situations uh, much like this one right here. Apparently, Bugsy Boy doesn't realize that he is up against a superior adversary this time. Ha, there he is again. Hold it, Daffy. Wait. Stop. Hold it. Wait. Wait. Daffy. Wait. Ha, trying to outfox the old master, eh? Aye! I wonder if that silly duck will remember that he can swim. Nope. I guess not. Listen, I'm a child at heart. If you have not realized that, I love me some cartoons. Uh, but, but don't we do the same thing to God that, that Daffy just did to Bugs, right? Like, has anyone ever been in this place and you've been like, uh, Lord, would you give me like a neon sign and give me clarity in my life, right? And it's like, we sit there and we're like, Lord, please talk to me. Um, but I feel like a lot of times, like God is a lot like Bugs Bunny. I mean, waving his arms frantically, telling us, hey, would you just pay attention? Listen to what I'm telling you. And, and a lot of times we're like Daffy Duck, just bulldozing our way past God, ending up in situations we weren't planning on being in, and all of a sudden we end up going off an unfinished bridge to our doom. I, listen, y'all didn't realize that Looney Tunes could preach, right? <laughs> listen, that's how drift happens in our life. That's drift. When, when, we, when we bypass the, the, the lessons and the things that God's trying to teach us, and we end up doing our own thing, and we end up in, in places we should never have been in the first place. Now, now last week, uh, Corey talked about a specific kind of drift. He talked about what happens when we stop climbing and we start coasting through our life. And, and specifically, what he was getting at was this, is that we need to actually have vision for our life so that we can climb with God. But if we're not careful, if we don't have vision, if we don't know where we're going, what can happen is we can end up coasting through life. Now, I want you to think of last week's message as being part one of really a two-part message. Because this week, I want to talk about that similar topic, but from a different perspective. Specifically, I want to talk about it like this. Uh, drift happens when we stop resting and we start running. When we stop resting and we start running. Now, when I'm talking about running, I'm talking about a very different thing that Corey was talking about last week. Uh, when I'm talking about running, I'm talking about this, that, that drift happens in our life when we stray away from God's divine plan and begin to run aimlessly or carelessly in our life. Now, we, we hear this language of like running a race um, from the Apostle Paul, and he talks about this idea of, of running this race with intentionality. Uh, and specifically, what, he, what, he, what we're really getting at is that this idea that, that running the race of life is like an ultra marathon. We gotta pace ourselves through it. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 9, he gives a very interesting caution to us that I want us to pay attention to this morning. He says this in verse 22. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize Skipping down to verse 26, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. See, we don't want to run through our life aimlessly. Now, I think two of the most asked questions in all of Christianity are probably these two right here. The first one being, 
God, what do you want me to do with my life? And the second one, much like the first one, is how then do I get there? What do you want me to do with my life, God? And, and how do I actually get to that place? See, I think Paul understands this, and I think we need to understand it too, uh, that, that we need to have vision and direction for our life in order for us to climb with him. And, and see, the Bible actually tells it like this, that it actually says, where the people have no vision, the people what? They perish. They perish. There is a need for us to have direction and vision for our life because, see, here's the thing. When we run aimlessly or carelessly in our life, honestly, we end up in situations that we were never meant to be in. I mean, situations, I mean, much like this one here. Let's hide in the attic. No, in the basement. Why can't we just get in the running car? Are you crazy? Let's hide behind the chainsaws. Smart. <laughs> yeah, okay. If you're in a horror movie, you make poor decisions. That's what you do. Shh, I'm being quiet. I mean, why can't we just get in the running car? And now, I understand. I get it. I understand that that's a really big exaggeration. I get it. I understand that. But the premise still remains true for us, right? Like, running without purpose never leads to anything good in our lives, right? It never does. Now, when I'm talking about running, I'm not talking about the physical act of running, okay? This, this idea of running aimlessly in our life a lot of times is fought in our mind. And so this morning, I, I want to bring up maybe just a little bit of clarity to this, and I want us to, to try to examine just a few ways that we could run aimlessly in our life, what causes us to run aimlessly in our life. The first one would be this, would be fear. Fear. That's a four-letter word with major implications in our life. Okay, think back to uh, this, our, our example there, right? Our movie example. Listen, yes, it's a major, it's a major exaggeration, but th they are running around scared, right? And it's not like as though they didn't actually have solutions to their problem, right? There were multiple solutions that were, that were presented to them. Hey, let's go into the house. Hey, let's go to the basement. Wait a minute, why don't we actually get into the running car and get the heck out of here? Right? But what's the problem? They were so afraid that they couldn't grasp the totality of what was going on and they ended up making a terrible decision. See, I think fear more times than not does not lead us to God, but it actually drives us away from him. So instead of us climbing intentionally with him and actually going after the things that God actually wants us to do, we end up running aimlessly and ending up in a place and situations that we were never meant to be in in the first place. So fear, that, that can cause us to run aimlessly. The, the next one is this, and this is a big one for us, uh, stress and anxiety. Oof, this is a big one for a lot of us, right? For being honest. I don't know if you know this, but when we get into a place of stress, we don't make good decisions, right? Like when you're stressed out, you never make good decisions. As a matter of fact, it is typically ill-advised of you to make any kinds of decisions when you're in a place of high stress. Uh, the George Alpers at the University of Mannheim says it like this. He says, stress and anxiety can both influence risk-taking in decision-making. While stress typically increases risk-taking, anxiety often leads to risk-adverse choices. In other words, it's like this. The more stressed you are, you will tend to make risky decisions. Like you can know exactly what God has told you. You could sit there and be like, I know the direction that God has for my life. But the moment we enter into the place of stress, something changes. The chemistry of our brain changes. And all of a sudden, we actually start taking risks that we we're never meant to take. On the flip side, however, if you are a really highly anxious person, you can actually end up in a situation where you feel stuck because you're so anxious about what is to come in your life. Both these things, they, they, they cause us to drift away from what God actually wants for us. And the final thing this morning would be this, control. Control. 
What do I mean by that? When we don't trust that God has a plan for us, we often tend to try to control our lives. Big yikes. Why? Because oftentimes we start making decisions and making moves that don't actually include God at all. Bigger yikes. Because here's the issue. In an effort for you trying to move forward in your life, in an effort for you trying to climb with God, in an effort for you to try to get ahead, what ends up happening is you try to control the outcome and you end up in a situation where you're digging a bigger hole for yourself in your life. Now listen, all these three things and much more than this is not an exhaustive list by any means. All of these things cause us to run aimlessly in our life or to drift away from what God's plan and intention is for your life. I think the, the solution, though, to this might seem a little bit counterintuitive and probably honestly a little bit counterproductive for us, but it's honestly the, the best thing that we can ever do, in, and it's really the cure for us to stop running aimlessly in our life, and it's really this. We need to learn to rest. Now, I know when I said rest, all you guys had a bunch of different thoughts that popped into your mind. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather with people around you, I want you to take three minutes. I want you guys to discuss this question here. What does rest look like to you? You guys have three minutes. Discuss that right now. All right, let's bring it back, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. I know three minutes is not a lot of time for us. Now, after talking with everyone around you, you probably realize that rest looks very different for everyone here, right? It, it looks very different. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but this morning, my hope is, is that I can bring some clarity to this idea because my heart is that we would learn what godly rest 
actually looks like in our life. Now, I understand when I talk about rest that I'm entering into a bit of a controversial subject for some people, and I understand why. Because for a lot of us, we, we equate rest with being lazy, right? Like, you know, that's the truth. We, we equate it with being lazy. Now, I am not advocating laziness. I am not advocating that at all, okay? But what I am endorsing is intentional time where we get recharged by God. Now, if you've been in church for a while, you've probably not heard the word rest as much as you've heard the word Sabbath, all right? And, and those two words are synonymous, okay? So, but for this morning, for the sake of clarity, I, I'm going to be talking from that, the, the word of rest. Because the truth is, rest is not just a Christian idea. It's not. Uh, as a matter of fact, the rest of the world is starting to catch up with what the Bibles have been telling us all this time. Uh, I want you to think about it like this. Did you know that you were actually created to rest? Uh, the CDC actually recommends that an adult, an adult, get seven or more hours of sleep per night. I know I don't do that. <laughs> like, that's, because I don't know if you guys realize this, but I actually have a baby now. So it makes it a little bit harder to get that, that, that seven hours of sleep. Uh, but babies actually need a lot of rest. I mean, they sleep all the time. It's wild, okay? But I learned this about a month and a half in, that babies, when they don't get enough rest, they enter, enter into this place called overtired. And nobody wins when that happens. <laughs> nobody wins when that happens. Because when they get overtired, it is almost impossible to get them to go to sleep. Just saying. <laughs> now, rest is also not just like, Culturally selective. As a matter of fact, in Israel, during Shabbat, okay, which was their time of Sabbath, right? During that time, it's an opportunity for them to actually ex to exercise their freedom from work. And if you happen to need to get to the top of a tall building during Shabbat, you might want to leave a little bit earlier from your home because the people of Israel realize that even pressing an elevator button is considered work. So, here's the best part. The elevators are programmed to stop on every single floor on the way up and on the way down. So if you're trying to get to the top of a 50-floor building, you're in some trouble. Now, how many of you all are familiar with the company Google? You guys like Google? Yeah. Hey, Google. Right? Google has the right idea. Because they encourage all of their employees to take naps during their day in their Google Pods. You want to take a look at this? Look, look at this, Google Pod. Listen, listen. I am trying really hard to convince Corey to get a few of those for the church. They're only 14 grand a pop. Only 14 grand a pop. It's not a big deal. We can totally afford that. I'm kidding. I'm really kidding. Uh, but here's what Google figured out. They figured out that if they allow their employees to take even just a half hour of sleep or just time of, of rest, even reading a book or even playing video games, what they have found is that it actually increases their productivity in the afternoon. I'm just saying, I think we should learn from Google here. <laughs> uh, one other fact for you all this morning, I don't know if you realize this, but holidays were not actually instituted by the government. They were originally called holy days and they were meant to be intentional times with God where we got together and rested. I'm just saying. But here's our problem. Most of us, if we were really honest with ourselves, don't like the idea of taking time to rest. We don't. I mean, here's the thing. In America especially, we don't get a lot of vacation days as is. But I think most of us, if we were really honest with each other, we would realize that we don't even like taking them in the first place. Because I think that most of us, if we could, we would work 24-7 if it meant we could earn more money and get more stuff. Now, you may not say it that boldly or that plainly, but I still think it's true. I mean, think about it. When you're in a conversation with people and they ask you, how's life going? Other than saying good, 
What's the most like common thing that we say? Man, I'm so busy. Life is so busy. Or we say at the churchy way, man, God just got me in a really busy season. Right? Right? And you know it's true. You know it's true. Right? You, you sit there and we, and we say that we're busy and we, we, we take it and we wear it like a, a badge of pride. I mean, seriously, we, we walk around and we're like, man, I'm so busy. Man, I've got, I'm juggling so much. I've got so many balls in the air that I'm trying to juggle. And we, we walk around like as though that's, that's our identity. And here's the truth, though. If you are running aimlessly in your life, you're running carelessly through your life and you don't have direction and you're saying you're busy, let me tell you something this morning, you're busy doing the wrong things. Let me say that again. If you are in a place of fear and operating out of fear, if you're operating out of a place of stress in your life, you're operating out of a place of control and you are running around frantically through your life and you don't have direction and you do not have purpose, let me tell you this morning, you are wasting your time. Let me say in another way for you, you cannot place your worth or your identity in your busyness. Too many of us are so busy trying to, to, to act like we're so important because we're so busy in our life, but the truth of the matter is that's not where your identity is found. Your identity is not found in the things that you do. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not advocating laziness by any means. But what I am saying is that we need to learn to have intentional times of rest just like the Bible teaches us. See, rest is incredibly important throughout Scripture. And we really don't have to go that far to find rest in the Bible. Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now let me clear up a couple misconceptions right here, okay? Times of rest do not have to happen on the seventh day. It doesn't just have to happen on your seventh day, okay? Just making that clear. The other thing is this. Did God actually have to rest? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, he has infinite power, infinite resources. I mean, if God really wanted to, he could have created the entire universe in one morning and still had enough time to catch his golf game that afternoon. Right? Why did he rest? He rested because he wanted to model for us what it looks like to take intentional times to relax, to rest. Look, it's important for us to work hard in our life. I am not saying that. It's important for us to work hard, but it's also important for us to rest hard as well. But I want to clarify some things when we talk about this idea of rest, because I'm sure when you guys were talking around your tables, you probably heard lots of different versions of rest. Okay, like rest can look like, oh, you know, going on vacation, and oh yeah, I, I, it can look like watching TV or it can look like playing video games, you know, if you're me. Um, but here's the problem. Those things are relaxing and they're leisurely, but they're not true rest. I want you to catch this. Those things are leisurely and they can be relaxing for us but they don't equate to real rest in our life. Not the kind of rest that Jesus is actually talking to us about. I want you to catch what Jesus says in Matthew 11. He says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in, in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me make the statement this morning. True rest can only be found in Jesus. True rest, true rest can only be found in Jesus, okay? True rest not, not only restores your spirit, but it restores your mind and your body as well. Can only be found at, in Jesus. 
But I love the fact, and, and this weekend as I was studying, I, it, was, it was amazing. I, I, I'd missed this part of the verse for all these years. But he doesn't just say it, simply say to come to him and rest. Did you catch the second line of that? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Wait a minute. What, what I think Jesus is trying to tell us is that if we would just learn to come to him and learn from him, we would not only gain our identity, but we would also gain direction for our life as well. If we would learn to simply come to him in a place of rest and learn from him, instead of us running through our life aimlessly and carelessly and operating out of a place of fear and stress and anxiety and control and allowing ourselves to, to be diverted and drift away from all the things that God actually has for us, if we would learn to rest in him and to gain direction from him, we would actually be able to climb towards the thing that God actually has for us, which will ultimately grow his kingdom and grow his influence throughout the earth. There's something about that when we actually come into the true place of rest of with God, when we enter into that place and we learn from him and allow him to speak into every area of our life, it actually will give us direction. It will give us a purpose for us to be able to climb with him and achieve all that God actually has for us. One of my favorite stories is it's found in Luke 10. And you probably know this story really well, but it says this. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Listen, Martha wasn't doing anything wrong. She wasn't. As a matter of fact, culturally, it was expected of her to take the time to prepare her house for the rabbi that was coming to visit her. She wasn't doing anything wrong. Jesus was not trying to rebuke her. What Jesus was actually trying to encourage her to do was to just slow down. Slow down, Martha. Slow down. Why? Because she's so busy doing all these many different things, but the most important thing, Jesus is sitting in her living room wanting to talk to her. Isn't that what we do in our life? I mean, seriously, if you think about it, it's not because what you are doing is wrong. It's not that working is bad. That is exactly what we're supposed to do. But hear me, if we don't take time to intentionally rest and get to the feet of Jesus and listen to him, we will walk through this life aimlessly and carelessly. Look, we get so busy trying to climb and to achieve and gain more stuff in our life that we often neglect the most important thing. And that's just to go to Jesus. It's just to go to Jesus. So how do we receive this, this true rest in our life? How do we get there? Guys, I, I wish I could tell you there's a, it's this really complicated formula or anything like that, but it's really not. It's simply this. We just need to learn to get before Jesus and sit at his feet. Just like Mary did, we need to choose to make him our primary focus and just learn to get before him and just sit at his feet. It looks like having intentional time with Jesus. Okay, times of worship. A month ago, I was talking about that. Like, worship is not about music. It's about what we get our eyes fixed on and we choose to exalt. Like, it's, it's taking intentional time to look at Jesus and go, Lord, I'm exalting you. I'm worshiping you. I'm get, making you my primary focus. It, it looks like time in the word where we allow the word to, to, to breathe life into us because the word of God is a living word that's a lamp unto our feet and, and a light unto our path. Like that's the purpose of the word of God is to help lead us and direct us and guide us. 
intentional rest looks like times of prayer, much, much like our 24-hour prayer experience that we're going to be doing in the, these next 24 hours, like time where we intentionally carve out time with God, where we seek his face and we learn from him. That's what true rest looks like in our life. Moments where we just slow down long enough to allow him to speak about himself and about our life. So this morning, as I I get ready to close, I'm going to invite the band back up, and they're going to play behind me. But most of you guys know a bit about about my story. But in my story, uh, I wasn't always doing this. I was actually going to school to become a professor of saxophone. Really strange, like to look at my life now. But I remember taking some intentional time to pray to get before Jesus and say, Lord, would you just, would you speak to me about what I'm supposed to do with my life? And I remember during that time, I remember Jesus just impressing on my heart this idea of like, you no, know, Sean, like, I want you to start leading worship and, and start preaching the gospel. And I wish I could sit here and tell you that I jumped at the opportunity. But my, my response to him was no, heck no. No chance. And the following six or so months began a season in my life where I was just running. I mean, running aimlessly through life. And it wasn't that God wasn't encountering me. It wasn't that God had abandoned me. It wasn't any of those kind of things. But I was so afraid. I was so afraid of failing, afraid of not being good enough, that I was just running. But during this time, I I recall reading a story found in 1 Kings, and it's the story of Elijah, and I don't have enough time this morning to, to go through the entire story, but Elijah was one of these Old Testament prophets, and Really amazing guy, like really cool. Like, I mean, calls fire down from heaven. I mean, I mean, prophesies that there would, that there would be the end to a drought and sees rain come back to a land. Uh, I mean, even like the power of the Holy Spirit out, outruns a chariot. I mean, it's pretty cool. But in the midst of all the amazing things that God was doing in him and through him, the king's wife Jezebel says, hey, I'm, I'm coming out to kill you. And, and Elijah takes off running and begins to run aimlessly. And God gets a hold of him and God says, hey, by the way, hey man, stop that. Why don't you go up to a mountainside and let's, let's have a conversation. So he goes onto this mountainside to have this like conversation with God and, and in the midst of all this, there, there's this mighty wind that blows by. There's this earthquake that takes place. There's this, this fire that comes through. And he's looking for God, but God is not in any of those big, mighty, crazy things. But when he took enough time to just get still before God, he realized that God was actually in the still, small voice. And when he got close enough to, to God, God was able to give him direction and purpose for his life. So I remember reading that and I remember going, okay, Lord, like, okay, maybe I need to do something similar. So I I remember taking a weekend away. I went to pray and fast for a weekend. And I just said, all right, Lord, like, all right, here's the deal. I'm not gonna run anymore. I'm not gonna run aimlessly. I'm not gonna run carelessly anymore in my life, but I'm, I'm gonna take a chance and I'm just gonna get before you. I'm gonna get on my knees and I'm gonna get before your feet and I'm gonna just say, Jesus, would you just speak to me? And guys, I'll tell you right now that the moment that I got before Jesus and I had stopped running and I just was intentional with him, all of a sudden, all of my running in a place of fear led me to walking in a place of faith. Because in that moment, Jesus spoke to me and he, he, he allowed me to realize that I didn't have to run anymore. I could climb with intentionality with him. This morning, I want to let you guys know that you don't need to run 
aimlessly through your life anymore. You don't need to run away in fear. You don't have to run in a place of stress or anxiety. You don't have to try to control every outcome of your life because you have a Savior who loves you, who cares about every single detail of your life. I mean, that, I mean that's why we do communion every week. Right? Like, it, it, it's not because we do it out of routine. It's because we, we recognize and we give thanks for a Savior who gives us hope. That we don't have to run through a life without purpose, that we can actually run with intentionality. So this morning, I, I want you to go ahead and grab your communion cups with me, and we're going to take communion together this morning. But specifically this morning, I, I want us to just begin to think. Think upon your life right now. Think about the, the hope that you have because of Jesus, that you, you don't have to just be busy doing the wrong things. You can actually come before him and sit at his feet. I mean, that's, that's communion right there. It's the intentional time that we take weekly to get before his feet and listen to him. So this morning, let's, let's take the bread and remember his body broken for us. Let's take the cup, remember his blood spilled for us as well. Lord, right now, we just come before you as your people. We just thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that we can come to you when we are, we are weary and we are burdened and we can find true rest in you. Jesus, we, we lay down all of our life to you this morning. The Lord, that we want to climb and we want to achieve all that you have for us, but Lord, but we don't want to just simply do it carelessly. Lord, we need direction, we need vision for our life. So this morning, Lord, I, I just pray, Lord, that you would help us. Help us to find intentional times of rest with you, Lord. Where you speak to us and we get to learn from you so that we can run this race of life to achieve the prize at the end. Lord, we love you. Amen, amen. This morning, we're going we're to go back into worship, but I want to make a specific call for, for prayer this morning. If you feel like you've been running through your life aimlessly, carelessly, if you feel like you've just been busy doing the wrong things, I, I want to let you know right now that our pastors and our elders, we're going to be right down front, and we want to pray with you this morning. Because God's heart for you is that you would run this race with intentionality. If you're in this place this morning and you would sit there and say, Sean, I, I hear you talking about this Jesus guy, but I've never actually been obedient. I've never actually given my life to, to the Lord. I want to let you guys know that this morning is that time. I want to make that call for you this morning to come running to Jesus, to get to his feet, because he will truly give you rest in your soul. So this morning, let's, let's stand up as we, we go back into that place of worship.